Hello, Scott here, and welcome to another episode of A Poll from the Shelf, where I pick a game from my library that I'm unfamiliar with, or one that I feel deserves to be in the spotlight, and take a deep dive into it to see if this game might be for me, and hopefully maybe for you also. So, this episode's pick is called Jaws of the Six Serpents by Tim Gray. Uh, Tim Gray, I uh, just want to let you know, Tim Gray is a uh, friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for quite some time. Uh, we've, you know, he's part of the UK crew that I pretty much converse with on a weekly basis. Uh, played games, t- talk about games, and pretty much anything in everyday life. So, just want to let you know that, uh, you know, I'm obviously he's a friend. So there may, you know, there may be a little bit of bias nature in there. But uh, this is not necessarily a review. This is just an in-depth. Uh, uh, first impression look at the book. So, uh, Tim, if I find anything wrong within this book that I disagree with, um, I'll let you know. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, so uh, I did pay for this book. Uh, I did pick this book up through Drive Through RPG. Uh, it came recommended, mind you, uh, not just from Tim himself, but likewise a couple other people that I've chatted with uh, in the Midchester Arms, which is this online pub. Uh, that we meet and discuss games and other things on a weekly basis on Fridays. So um, it uh, piqued my curiosity, and I decided to uh, pick the game up, and uh, it sat on my shelf for a while, but I thought it was time that I take it down and, and take a look at it. So so we'll take a look at the back here. Uh, Silver Branch, let's see here. We'll start at the top. Days of High Adventure. Uh, Silver Branch Games takes the fan favorite PDQ system. I'm not familiar with that system at all, but uh, hopefully it will be described within the pages here. Um, Into the realms of sword and sorcery and the grittier sides of fantasy. The PDQ rules, um, the PDQ core rules, additional rules for the genres of fantasy. I guess that's what's inside here. So what you get, the PDQ core rules, additional rules for these genres of fantasy setting outline for the land of the six serpents and notes on adapting for different settings. PDQ lets you give your character whatever qualities are most dramatically important and provides a simple framework for resolving any type of conflict. Interesting. Okay. So let's see here. So inside written and designed by Tim Gray, uh, art cover art swords defiant by storm cook. And the PDQ system design is by Chad Underkoffler, Atomic Sock Monkey Press. And this was published in 2009, so it has been around for a while. So we've got the table of contents here. Uh, let's see here, four, five, well, five chapters. Uh, introduction, PDQ core rules, rules for six serpents, world, world of six serpents, and then GM notes, which probably involves advice and whatnot. Okay, so what does Tim have to say about this particular game here? Uh, This is an old world. Civilizations have risen and fallen and most likely will again. Uh, Now hunting uh, hunting beasts prowl the ruins of their cities and monuments, and tribes take refuge in their shadows. They fell by cataclysm and senility, and today we know little enough of their ways and lore. But the people we know began as their scions or servants, and those that are different were made so by the ancient arts to suit their purposes. Some say it was it was they who set the urges, capital U, so I imagine that's something within the game, uh, on their current course of conflict and destruction, whether by plan or sin or mishap. It is an a it is an axe age, a sword age, a storm age where the strong prey upon the weak and death can come suddenly. All right, so we begin uh, with a little sidebar here. Uh, role-playing game. What is a role-playing game? And this has been a, a, a contested point of contention for a long, long time now, just kind of recently reared its ugly head uh, in online discourse. Um, you know, the, the introduction to your game, uh, should it or should it not include... Uh, some sort of description of what a role-playing game is, because some people, and I think this probably includes myself, feel that regardless on how ridiculous and uh, your role-playing game may be, or obscure, or independent, or whatever the case may be, uh, there's always a chance, always, however minor and minute and minuscule it may be, it's their first role-playing game. You never know. 
Um, <clears throat> and so providing a description uh, to people who are new to role-playing games of what a role-playing game is, is recommended. Now, that can take uh, you know shape in many different fashions. Uh, I have seen pages and pages of what, what is a role-playing game in some books, along with a highly detailed description of a game in action, and others where it may just simply be a, a joke or a blurb, uh, but, but something to just kind of you know give it a basis, basic of a, a basis of definition. So uh, here we have uh, a role-playing game, RPG, is a leisurely activity for a group of people. These players sit around, pretend to be imaginary characters having adventures in a fictional setting. Uh, each controls a player character, PC, except one who takes the role of Game Master, GM, setting up situations for the PCs and controlling the other characters they meet, non-player characters or NPCs. The players say what their characters do, and the GM tells them what happens next. They use the rules to decide whether actions succeed or fail. The story progresses through scenes of actions and particular locations. You'll need pincer, pencils and paper and about three six-sided dice. Perfect. I mean, there could be, uh, you know, th that's pretty much in, in, in a nutshell. You know, it's succinct. It kind of gives you a basic idea. Obviously, if you continue reading within this book, you're going to figure out more. Um, so, <clears throat> so continuing on. So we got through the the introduction of the world. What is a role-playing game? Uh, Jaws of the Serpent is a self-contained fantasy role-playing game that aims toward the sword and sorcery or pulp fantasy side of the genre. It is a simpler, more direct, one might say macho, <laughs> uh, world than those of many popular fantasy RPGs. Characters take on adversity for reasons that are, un that that are usually personal rather than the grand cause and triumph through a strong sword arm and quick wits. It's not a world where marketplace is strong with dozens of intelligent species or where enchanted items can be found under every rock. So it's not D&D. &D. You know, it's not high fantasy. It's, it's, it's following the sword, sword and sorcery genre. Uh, and it seems to reflect that in its, in its introduction. Okay. So we have an author's note included here. Uh, what does Tim have to say about this? The game originally arose from comments about my PDQ fantasy game, Questers of the Middle Realms. Uh, which is aimed at traditional fantasy role-playing game with a humorous, tri humorous, humorous twist. There we go. <laughs> I can talk. Uh, that's all very well, said the commenters, but why don't you do a serious PDQ fantasy game? So you can see if there's any blame to be a, a portion for this project, it should fall on those guys. Fair enough. Okay. So, continuing on, magic is present, well-known and powerful, but the sorcerers who practice it are few and often regarded with fear and hostility for the danger they present. Large, quotes, civilized settlements are few and far between, and harsh environments are themselves challenging opponents for characters. Monsters are usually other people. Uh, fierce beasts, often larger and more aggressive than their counterparts in our own world, or unnatural things that claw their way in from realms beyond or are created by sorcery. Uh, Jaws uh, also aims to support darker fantasy, worlds with low technology, some magic, supernatural creatures, and crucially, characters who are up against it with a death of with with death a constant companion. These tales tend to have a pragmatic and unflattering view of human nature, shared by most of the characters in the setting. And main characters wrestle with whether they can or should rise above this. So, all right. So yes, sword and sorcery in a nutshell. Uh, might makes right. Uh, sorcery and magic is scary, usually evil. Uh, beasts are, you know, things that you contend with more than monsters. And when you when you confront a monster or demon or such other uh, otherworldly thing, um, it usually ends up with not you necessarily defeating it, but barely getting away uh, by the seat of your pants to live another day. So, so yeah. So this. I mean, generally speaking, this this is going to be this is going to reflect a lot of things that exist within the OSR. Uh, but uh, the major difference is the rule system. So, what I'm probably going to focus on here more than the setting itself is what is PDQ. Uh, what makes this particular rule set stand out uh, more so some, than some other things, and then maybe touch upon the world itself. You know, what makes this world special and different than uh, some of the other uh, sword and sorcery options out there. So. So we're going to go ahead and just dive right into the PDQ core rules. 
Okay. So what is PDQ? <clears throat> so the pros descriptive qualities PDQ system has been designed for evocative simplicity, speed, and flexibility in play. It has three levels of resolution suitable for any type of situation. Okay, so simple. Uh, the core element of PDQ is the concept of, of a prose, descriptive, do-it-yourself, wide-ranging quality, standing in it as a tribute, advantage, merit, flaw, skill, or in, in capability. They're ranked on a simple scale of ranks, or they're rated on a simple scale of ranks, and the rules provide tools for comparing these when characters compete against each other or their surroundings. Okay? Uh, when you make a character, you'll be able to buy a certain number of ranks to split between qualities as you wish. Whatever is important about a character is written down as a quality. These should grow out of the character concept and game setting. This gives you great freedom to create the character you want. Qualities are often drawn from five general areas. We have physical, uh, having to do with the body, athleticism, or natural talents. Uh, mental, areas of study, intellectual acuity, education. Social, groups, uh, groups the character is, groups the character is a member of, okay, groups the character is a member of, or associates with skills in dealing with people. Fine. Professional, knowledge and skills picked up on the job. Other, uh, esoteric skills, magical powers, or physical resources. Okay, so we've got five uh, different aspects to your character. Physical, mental, social, professional, and other. Okay, next up we have uh, penumbra. <clears throat> Qualities represent a broad skill or field of knowledge. True, okay. It, what the heck? Oh boy, has that been on my lip the whole time? Well, oh well. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Nothing, nothing like uh, 12 minutes of uh, being on camera when your lunch is stuck in your beard. Okay, carrying on. Qualities represent a broad scale or field of knowledge. If a particular quality is relevant at all to an action or topic, the character may apply that quality when attempting the, that action or understanding that topic. This is called the penumbra or shadow or of the quality. Okay. I'm following, I'm following. Therefore, a player shouldn't choose qualities that are too narrow or its penumbra uh, will cast too narrow a shadow. Okay. Uh, too broad in identifying the sorts of things that should fall under the penumbra becomes pointless. The parameters for what's too broad or too narrow are up to the individual GM. Okay. Got it. Okay. Remember to make, remember to make sure you and the GM have the same understanding of the abilities you choose. Write a sentence or two of description for ones that are ambiguous. For example, the quality swordsmanship uh, would be useful not just in hacking away at things, but also in cleaning and maintaining swords, okay? discovering the location of nearby swordsmiths and fencing trainers and so forth. Okay, I'm getting it, following. Oops. If the player had instead selected a quality of rapier fighting, the quality would only be useful in fighting with that kind of sword and involve knowledge surrounding rapiers exclusively. Okay, fair enough. So yeah, so when you're you're creating your character, you you, you know you want a more generalization uh, of what they do, so that you're the the shadow that that is being cast uh, by these particular skills or qualities, uh, you know, is is it falls falls on a wider range uh, rather than being exclusive and narrow to a specific well subject matter. So. Okay, overlapping qualities. If a situation falls under the penumbra of more than one of your qualities, all of them can help to accomplish the task. Right. Okay, that's, I, I'm glad that's referenced, but to me that probably would have been assumed, or, and if it wasn't, it, it, it would have been argued during the game, I'm sure. Okay, so what do we have here? Next we have the ranks. So your qualities have ranks, uh, which indicate increasing proficiency from lower to highest. The ranks are poor, negative two, average being zero, Good plus two, expert plus four, and master plus six. Okay. The numbers in square brackets following the rank of quality show the rank's modifier. Um, how much is added to or subtracted from a 2d6 die roll? Okay, so there we go. We get what's being used for resolution within the game. 2d6s. Um, see task resolution. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Characters have some things going for them, strengths, and at least one thing working against them, weaknesses. At everything else, characters are neither noteworthy nor inept. They have countless unspecified, invisible, average qualities, zero. At character creation, buying the first rank of quality lets you write it down at good, okay, which is a plus two. You've effectively raised one of your invisible qualities one rank. 
See the PDQ master table on next page for ranks and modifiers. Okay, so yes, so here we go. So we've got poor through master, and then we have difficulty ranks. So five, seven, extreme being 13. Okay, so yeah. Um, so if you're rolling 2d6, uh, depending on the, the what you're trying to get, you're trying to get anywhere between a five and a 13, and then yes, you're going to need... Uh, certain ranks to even come close to achieving some of those things. All right, a strength is a positive aspect, a benefit, skill, talent, and so on of a character. Come up with a word or a pithy phrase to sum up the strength. Examples include fighting, willpower, fly like a bird, find bargains, and run away. Okay. A weakness is a negative aspect of the character, stemming from ignorance, flawed understanding, physical or mental incapability, or some other vulnerability. Let's see here. Examples are glass jaw, weak willed, slow as molasses, and shy. Weaknesses are always poor, a negative two rank. All right. So, depending on the character concept, inequality can be a strength or a weakness. For example, suppose a character has hook handed as a quality. If it's ranked average zero or above, it's a strength. The character can use his hook as a weapon in physical conflicts or as a threat or even in inventive things like picking a lock and so on. With increased chance of success, but if it was a weakness, negative two, the character keeps getting his books stuck into things, forgets about them when he tries to scratch his head, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> got it. So just because it's a negative description doesn't mean that it is necessarily a weakness. It is the rank that is applied to it, uh, whether it's a, um, uh, a strength uh, or a weakness. Right? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm following along. So so far it's interesting. Um, it, it's it doesn't seem overly uh, complicated. And as far as I can tell, the resolution system is simple: two d six and add or subtract your modifier. All right. When buying ranks of of qualities, players can choose between having more qualities at a lower level of competency or having fewer qualities at a higher level. Okay. Um, if you throw everything into one area of expertise, you really shine when that type of action comes up, but you'll be unimpressive with other things. Okay, self-explanatory. That's good. Uh, overlapping qualities. Uh, I'll probably just skip over that. Tweaking choices. Never fear. After play begins, a particular quality sees no use and doesn't really add to the characterization of a PC. A player should feel free to change it to something that fits better, but only after talking to the GM. Okay, so yeah, so there's... You you can play with your character, which which is nice. I mean, granted, this is true in any game. There's nothing, you know, pointing a gun to your head after you create your character saying no, uh, uh, other than just, you know, the general balance of the game and, of course, you know, the, the, the fair and balanced aspect of your other players. Um, and But here it does kind of, you know, give you permission, so to speak. It's like, hey, I really don't like this character. It's not playing well. Can I tweak it a little bit? And, of course, if your GM feels... It's been a deficit to your fun time. Then, of course, you know let's let's work this out and see what we can create. All right, gear. The baseline position for PDQ is that characters are assumed to have the equipment needed to perform the skills reflected in their qualities, but that makes no difference to how effective they are. Okay, for instance, different weapon types don't in themselves make any difference to the damage you do in combat. Having a sword that enables you to just use your sword fighting quality. The system defaults to focusing on the characters, not the equipment list. However, you can assign qualities to objects. Ah, okay. Making them important to the story. The simplest is, is just the general quality. Small Q of the thing reflects materials, workmanship, and so on. Uh, you know, i.e. good plus, plus two ancestral sword. Okay. This comes into play when the, in the item performs its function, adding to any other qualities that apply. Okay, so... So the quality of what it is you're using, uh, you can you can give <clears throat> uh, certain aspects to it to um, modify your die roll. So it's not not there's no difference between a sword or a spear if I'm reading it correctly. But uh, if you have a fine quality spear or something that you define as a special type of metal, it itself gives it a, a higher quality rather than just being a different type of weapon. Okay, character items. Uh, these are objects that have been bought using the available quality rings during character creation. Uh, they are effectively part of the character. Having invested in such an item, the player should not be permanently deprived of it, though the character might lose use of it temporarily if lost, stolen, or in need of repair. 
uh, and will be compensated by a fortune point. I see later. Props. These are objects that are not part of the character, but are available for characters to use for a while, like a good plus two bag of coins. You don't start with any, they're gained and lost in play. Okay, and then living beings as gear, uh, horses or squires. Okay, and they have qualities too. All right, moving on. Powers. There are supernatural and magical things beyond what ordinary people can do. Right, magic. Okay, uh, so we have examples here. Breathe fire, move objects, summon, insect swarm, astounding leap, and so on. Uh, notation with re regarding it, though. When listed, powers are marked with an asterisk. Uh, it is wise to do this on the chapter sheet, too, as sometimes it's important to know whether something's magical. Okay? Active powers. When you put the first rank into a power that lets you do anything special, like hurl lightning or changing shape, you get it at average zero, not good, plus two. The benefit is gaining the ability to do it at all. Okay, makes sense. You'll see later this also means characters specializing in powers are slightly less able to soak up damage. A uh, trade-off. Um, enhancements. Sometimes a powers, uh, power enhances an existing capability, like improving one's sense of smell or making a bow more accurate. The first rank buys good as, as normal, providing a mod. Okay, so, so, so far, um, you know, uh, easy rules. Uh, it's, it's pretty much, uh, I think we're going into, yes, the resolution system next, but right off the top of, uh, right in the first few pages, a clear understanding of how the game works. Uh, it's not a crunch. There's not a lot of crunch to this game. Uh, it seems to be easily understandable. So, of course, what it's doing is, is is putting more focus on, you know, the the story or the game that you're playing in, uh, the adventure, the uh, what, whatever it is that your characters are doing. You're not being bogged down uh, with, with a set of rules as you're uh, trying to find a particular set of things on your character sheet. Uh, do you or do you not have any ability to, to utilize this particular thing with, in regards to a task? And uh, a basic 2D6 system and add or subtract uh, particular quality modifiers depending on what it is you're trying to do. So yeah, uh, sounds like so far it's, it's, it, it's, it fits within that sword and sorcery style that is indicative with most uh, OSR games is being uh, you know fast, easy, uh, adventurous, you know, keep the pace rolling, keep the game going, keep the adventure, you know, going, don't let the rules get too much in the way or bog it down to the point of it stopping. And th this, this seems to reflect it so far. I like it. All right. Ah, task resolution basics. So these are applied when the task is clear cut for simple situations. So this, this has a uh, little chapter in here, simple situations. So basic things. Uh, there are no, uh, Outstanding issues interfering with the attempted action or randomness would bog down the game. The GM looks at the PDQ master chart and determines the difficulty rank of the task, then compares that to the character's most appropriate quality rank. If that character's rank is higher, they simply succeed with no dice roll reply required. So, again, uh, like in other systems where, you know, they... They don't want you rolling for everything, you know. Uh, I scratch my nose. Well, roll me a d20. And be sure and add your plus one dexterity modifier, or you may accidentally, you know, give yourself a nosebleed. Um, you know, ridiculous things, uh, but uh, even basic tasks. Uh, so here, uh, what are simple situations? Uh, you don't necessarily uh, just, you know, automatically accomplish it, but as long as your uh, your rank is higher than the than you know the um, what is required to succeed. Uh, you automatically succeed. So, example, uh, Janos wants to climb a good uh, TN9 cliff using his expert plus four outdoorsman quality. Because his rank is higher, he simply succeeds. So, good, is, would, which would be a plus two, I guess, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, or zero, I forget. Uh, but expert is plus four. So, higher rank, boom, you're right up that side, side of the cliff to the top. But complicated situations, they involve a single die roll to determine, uh, this in, these involve a single die roll to determine success or failure. Use them when a character's quality isn't high enough to make the task routine or when the story calls for tension. Uh, to attempt a complicated situation, roll two regular sided, uh, two regular six sided dice, 2d6. Add the two results together and add on the modifier for your quality rank, zero if you don't have any relevant qualities. 
Uh, to succeed, your total must, e must equal or beat the target number of the task of the task difficulty rank. The TN might come from the GM's assessment of, of abstract difficulty for a task, or it might come from the opposing character's quality rank, so opposing roles. Example, Janos up the good TN9 cliff is oh, following, sorry, following Janos up the good TN9 cliff is uh, Kat, Katarin, uh, Katrin, Katrin, Katarin. Yeah, I'll just say Katarin. <laughs> uh, who only has a good plus two agile to help her. And that's equal to the difficulty she must roll for it. With her quality, quality that's 2d6 plus two, aiming for a total of at least nine. She rolls a three and a five, giving her a total of nine, and scrambles up to the top. There you go. Easy peasy. Uh, 2d6 resolution. Uh, those games that just use use that, you know, the, the 2d6 system always seem to, uh, the rule system are always easy and designed for, you know, more cinematic action oriented games where you don't want a lull. Uh, sword and sorcery being pretty much uh, one of those genres. Conflict situations. These involved active resistance from another player trying to punch a guy in the face and so on. Okay, yeah, get that. Um, complex situations progress through a series of exchanges where characters compare the results of 2d6 plus modifier rolls. The higher the, su the higher successful result wins and does damage to the loser. PDQ uses an abstract form of damage that reflects reducing ability to influence the course of the story rather than simul you know, simulating cuts, bruises, and so on. The conflict goes back and forth with opponents wearing each other down until one of them is out of the contest. There are more detailed rules for this in a couple pages. Upshifts, upshifts, uh, upshifts and downshifts. What are those, Tim? Uh, these cause a roll to be made as if the quality were one rank higher, essentially giving an additional plus two roll. Okay, so I think that's... The player describes an attempt to perform an action in a particularly flavorful or entertaining way. The, DM, the GM can give an upshift for that action. So rather than I hit the sailor, I grab the sailor's shirt with one hand and pull him closer to punch him in the face with my other fist. Fantastic. You know, you're, you're using uh, descriptive qualities within the game to make it more interesting and fun. Why not give you a plus two? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, upshift above master rank. Uh, let's see here. This would change the roll from 2d6 plus 2 to 2d6 plus 4. Yes. Uh, upshifts above master rank. Add an extra die to the character's roll. So instead of 2d6 plus 6 plus 2, you roll 3d6 plus 6. A further upshift would be 4d6 plus 6, and so on. Once you get to these dizzying heights, results should be impressive. All right. And downshifts. Yeah, downshifts are the opposite, I would imagine. They work well to reflect changes in complexity of the situation, but GM should not try to overuse them as situational modifiers. Correct. Yeah, I'd agree. Don't, don't be mean. Don't be cruel. Uh, downshifts below poor rank. Yeah, same thing. Okay. So conflict rules. Initiative. How does Tim handle initiative in this game? Uh, conflicts proceed as a series of turns during which every character has a chance to take an action and react to the actions of others. Okay, uh, with each turn, with each turn, figure out who goes first. That is, who has initiative. It follows a number of broad brackets in the following order. Um, it may depend on the situation. Okay, <laughs> if the character attacks without warning, take the victim, take taking the victim by surprise, the attacker automatically goes first. Okay. So yeah, just narrative uh, uh, initiative, so to speak. Uh, some sort of stealth versus perception check is often used. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, you could do that. But, I mean, you know, if they weren't paying attention, they weren't paying attention. Don't roll for surprise if they're scratching their butt and, and uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, God knows what. And then, oh, they just happen to see people not moving in complete darkness. Yeah, whatever. You know, they were surprised. In many cases, the interior of a conflict goes first, or the initiator of a conflict goes first, even without surprise. Okay, for the first turn, at least. Characters with a speed or reaction time quality relevant to the situation, uh, fastest sword in the east, and so on, act in order of their ranks. Okay. Characters with no special speed act. If any characters happen to be unusually slow, they act last at all. Okay, so so essentially situational uh, initiative. Uh, you know, if they have a descriptive quality, you know, meaning that you know they're they're fast or agile, or you know, quickest draw. You know, as you you know. 
Uh, you know, remember that's based on your personal description of it. There's not a list of things in here. Um, and then essentially no one with, with just nothing. They just go after that. And then finally, anyone who has something that actively is slowing them down or some sort of quality that makes them slower. All right, moment of truth. The character whose turn it is will be called the attacker. Uh, the character who is the target of the attacker's action is called the defender. Uh, the attacker's player explains what the attempted action is, so on and so forth. The both of them roll 2d6 and add the appropriate modifiers. Uh, if the attacker gets a higher total, damage is applied to the defender. If the defender's result is higher, no damage is done. A tie is just that. Nobody wins, nobody loses. Uh, but they are both slightly fatigued or discomforted. Okay, damage. How are you doing damage here? Uh, damage, be it physical, mental, emotional, or social, is the loss of a capability. As a character takes damage, they are less likely to be able to perform at peak efficiency. This is shown by a number of damage ranks. Effectively, downshifts to the character's list, listed of, uh, abilities the, the last at, that lasts at least the length of the current conflict. The damage, if damage wipes out all the character's quality ranks, they zero out, lose a conflict with whatever consequences might follow. Uh, there are two types of damage, failure ranks and damage ranks, caused by different kinds of harm. Character can suffer both types in the course of a conflict. Uh, okay. Mental or social, some physical conflicts. We use failure ranks. Examples include a chess match, witty repartee, and running a race. Um, failure ranks are almost always completely recovered at the end of the scene. In more physical conflicts, it is damage ranks, which can persist over several scenes. Examples here include just combat weapons, but also environmental damage, falling off a rock, or starting to drown. All right, so how do we apply these damages? Uh, in a successful attack, the difference between the, the attacking and defending totals determine how much failure or damage ranks are done. If the, role, if the roles are tied, both characters take a single failure rank. Okay. Each point of damage re reduces one quality per rank. It will damage, it will damage at, the, at that lower rank until the character recovers from the damage. Uh, it will function, sorry. Uh, the character's player selects which qualities take the damage and can be spread and can spread the damage out across several abilities at once. All right, so here's the example. I, uh, I most games carry this, but trust me, uh, you know, as someone who's dys dyslexic, I could read that again and again and again, and sometimes it just won't click. It's having examples of how your rules work are vital uh, to quite a lot of us who, um, you know, don't necessarily read or absorb information, um, you know, what's considered to be normally. So, Cortag has gotten into a bar fight with a local thug. He has expert plus four brawling, and the thug also has brawling, but at good, a plus two. Cortag, being a, a player character, gets his swing in first and rolls 2d6 plus four, okay, uh, for a result of 10. The thug's defense is 2d6 plus two for a result of eight. The difference is two, so the thug takes two failure points. Okay, got it. If he allocates the, those to his brawling quality, they'll take it down from good to average to poor. Okay, so as you are taking damage within the PDQ system, you're not just you're not removing hit points, but uh, you essentially your your qualities and how you're going to perform are going to slowly start to slide until you zero out. So let's see. Yep, once everything is gone, you are zeroed out in any level below poor. Um, any further damage is unimportant. Zeroing out like this can mean the character has totally flubbed the seduction attempt, been knocked unconscious in combat, and if possible, the player describes how and why the PC is out of the scene. Okay. If unable or unwilling, the GM can depict the loss of conflict. If the scene continues after the character falls, for instance, if there are other heroes yet fighting, the GM lets the player know when they can return. Right. So what are the consequences? Uh, just because a character zeroes out in physical conflict doesn't mean they die. Okay, well that's, all right, so point of distinction right there. Uh, you know, obviously this th there's reflections of OSR in its setting. Uh, it, it's quick and easy rules, but right here, and I'm not pointing this out to say that there's anything wrong with this. I'm just pointing, pointing this out as this is one of the differences between OSR and, and old school style games of Sword and Sorcery where usually once you're out, you're out for good. Uh, some people enjoy that, some people don't. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, you, you, can, you can enjoy both, um, or you can enjoy one, uh, whatever makes you happy. Uh, but uh, but just, you know, just wanted to make a, a point of distinction here. However, it does mean they are unconscious or otherwise helpless. 
and at the mercy of an opponent. Sometimes zeroing out is just the prelude to the character being shoved into a villain's death trap. In situations other than in physical battle, an opponent might inflict other kinds of harm on a helpless foe, like destroying their reputation. Okay. So we've got environmental damage here. That's the description there. Just going to you know, breeze over that because we're, we're running a little long here. Uh, but mind you, this is a pull from the shelf, so this is a deep dive. These are going to be longer videos. All right, recovering from damage, uh, momentary damage. If nothing else is going on and the character is otherwise safe, relaxed, and lacking any time constraints, all failure and damage ranks are removed. Okay. Uh, continuing danger. If the scene just gone was part of a, an overarching situation that's risky, stressful, or are under deadline, characters recover all loss, failure ranks, but only uh, 1d6 damage ranks. Okay. Excuse me. Special damage recovery. We have intri intrinsic qualities. Uh, we have, you know, such as a healer, uh, mundane aid, uh, you know, someone helping you out, emergency aid, first aid, or oratory. I mean, again, not all damage in this game, as referenced, is physical. And thorough aid. Uh, this takes at least several minutes, and perhaps equipment and facilities. So yeah, so you you have you have options within the game to to heal yourself. Uh, if necessary, in a uh, you know in, in in the middle of some sort of conflict, so and of course supernatural aid. Okay, understanding PDQ damage, what it stimulates or what it, what it stimulates, <laughs> uh, what it simulates. Okay, so just this declining power to attract the direction and outcome of the action. It's abstract. There's no requirement for the allocation of damage to qualities to make sense. So if you're wondering why getting stabbed with, with a knife damages your relationship with your clan, don't worry about it. That said, if you want to come up with justifications to add a bit of color, you're entirely free to do so. My clan uses ritual knife fights to settle disputes, so getting beaten means I lose face. You know, there you go. There you go. That's, you know, that, that's, that's a nice way to justify a, a different type of system when it comes to damage uh, during a conflict of any sorts within a role-playing game because most people generally use hit points. Uh, but for those who have been playing um, RPGs for quite some time, uh, you, you kind of see through the matrix and you do realize that uh, even hit points, uh, there's issues with that. Uh, and, and things and questions arise in regards to hit points and what they actually are in regards to the game. So... So don't shy away from games that that handle damage differently, uh, because there's several different there's several interesting ways uh, to deal with conflicts that can damage your character mentally, physically, and so on. Uh, that can be just as satisfying as the the old vanilla standard of hit points. All right, so we go on to give us uh, some options for story hooks within the game, uh, notes and options overlapping and stacking. Okay, so, and then some, some examples of characters working together, dealing with multiple targets. That's, that's something that needs to be done within a sword and sorcery game. Uh, time, range, and movement. Uh, range and conflict. Movement and conflict. So we're, we're dealing with, uh, you know, turns, actions, uh, you know, how far can I move during each turn and so on and so forth. Uh, poor qualities and conflicts and downshift options. So options to the downshift. Okay. So there we are. We, we, that's a basic description of, of PDQ. Uh, and you know, it's over, you know, a few pages. So I, I can see how and why this particular game or these particular rule set is, can be utilized by several people and enjoyed, uh, in, in, you know, fast and furious games of sword and sorcery and other, fantasy style genres or genres that ref that reflect that type of uh, conflict such as things within sword and sorcery and whatnot uh, again you want it simple you want it to to move quickly within combat uh, you want resolution to be easy to decipher and because you want to you know you want to stick with the action you want to get with with the with the story you want to get with the the adventure all right so we got here a conflict example uh, which is always nice. Again, examples in the games are important to me. And then we have we have rules for six serpents. So, all right. So, what do we have within six serpents? We have a, we have a general understanding of PDQ, but what does six serpents provide you? 
Um, so we have a description of the peoples of the six serpents. So, okay. Uh, you'll need a name for your adventurer and at least basic impressions th they give to people whom they meet for the first time. You can add much more information about their background if you like. For sword and sorcery, the most important thing to bear in mind throughout is that they should be iconic, interesting and appealing enough that readers of their stories would come back for more. That, that includes evocative quality names like swift as a serpent instead of fast. Okay, so what, what Tim's trying to reflect here is within your game, you're not just playing uh, within, you know, Hyperborea. Uh, you are trying to evoke a, you know, a, a sense of story as if you are um, par part of the author of what's going on uh, within these stories of adventure, you know, we'll just use Hyperborea as an example, but we've got, you know, six serpents also. But but within this fantasy sword and sorcery world, um, it's, you know, what he's trying to do is to apply more flavor and evocative narrative to the game. But again, it's not necessarily, it's it hasn't fully fallen onto um, the position of storytelling games, narrative-driven games. Uh, the, the aspects are here to add flavor to it, to make it more exciting, to make the world, you know, breathe and live more. Uh, but, um, but not necessarily just a couple people sitting around a table telling stories. That's the impression that I'm get. I'm not, I'm not essentially saying that's what Tim's trying to do, but that's kind of the impression that I get just kind of from this paragraph right here in character creation. So, um, you must take one rank, uh, in each of these. Uh, most Jaws games assumes that all characters are human and that cultural groups have common traits. The peoples have lists of associated qualities. Choose your, your character's people and pick one strength from the list to reflect their birthright. A personal faculty, uh, no, yep, uh, an innate talent like brawn, wits, or perception. A driver that will motivate the character to action. A personality trait like ambition, attachment, virtue, or vice. Uh, open qualities. You have five ranks to allocate to whatever qualities you wish. Buying a quality at good takes one rank. Expert takes two, and master takes three. Okay, so point by system uh, for your ranks in character creation. You can add ranks to your required qualities. Uh, you might want to take some of the other. You might take. You might want to take some of the other people's strengths. It's best to have at least one broad. One, one broad, one like an occupation, at least one quality that'll help in a fight, and at least one kind of action you're really good at. Okay. You must also take one quality at poor for an area where your character has difficulties. Find one that'll be interesting to play. Make sure you have space to record fortune points and learning points, uh, as I seem that's probably the experience to, to raise the ranks of those. So, Peoples of the Six Serpents. So, within the, the world of the Six Serpents, we have the Devil Folk of Ahan. Uh, strengths are Night Vision, Arcane Lore, and so on. Weaknesses, Vulnerable to Temptation, Outsider, uh, and so on. Then we have the Witch, for, the witch Folk of Bellamar. Uh, they are intelligent, perceptive, and secretive, uh, but they're very curious. We have the Earth Tribes of Colette, uh, Wood Urge, Warrior, Oratory, and Alchemy. Uh, but they're impulsive and uncivilized. Uh, we have the Cliff People of Narrow Home, uh, improvising, climbing, bargaining streetwise, uh, but uh, they're pushy and scruffy. And we have the Mask Folk of Nilsomar, uh, inscrutable, misdirection, trade, and art of performance. Uh, weaknesses are civilized, but they're not distinct. Oh, there's more. Jeez. <laughs> All right. Hey, nothing wrong with selection or options, I should say. Uh, water people of Quagin or Quagin, uh, semi-aquatic, uh, swimming, uh, boating, water urge, but weaknesses are uncivilized, vulnerable to dehydration, and so on. Uh, the freemen of Rivertown, steady, practical, craft, specify, trader, boating, and so on. But their weaknesses, they're inflex, they're inflexible, unimaginative, unimaginative, and civilized. Interesting. Citizens of Sartain, streetwise connoisseur and intrigue, but they're civilized, unprincipled in vain. And finally, we have the Almen of uh, Temesarum, nocturnal, keen senses and stealth, uh, but they're sensitive to light. All right, so, so quite a variety here uh, to choose from, 
uh, and there there are suggestive qualities here, uh, but I believe Tim claimed uh, that you can decide to pull other people's strengths if you like, uh, you know, make make your own character. Uh, let's see here, special quality types. So we have fate. Some sword and sorcery characters have a long-standing appointment with fate. Uh, something's going to happen later in the story, for better or worse. Uh, if a character seems to require it, here's how. Make this available to generate story hooks. Uh, making this available to generate story hooks is obviously important, so it needs to be strength, or needs to be a strength. Instead of adding its, its mod to rolls, allow it to be triggered up, up to mod times per game. Okay, interesting. That's fine. Fame. Uh, giving the character reputation is a simple use of qualities. It affects social interactions when it comes to play, either as a strength or a weakness. Okay. And then possessions. And then we already, I think he touched on that, of course, earlier. But uh, gear is covered in more detail in gear, wealth, and trade. Okay. Quality inspiration lists. Okay. So, so we have occupations here, uh, you know, to kind of give you suggestions if you don't have something set up. Uh, talents. Uh, skills and personality traits. And then we, we continue on with a, a sample character called Callum. And then we have fortune points. Uh, these are a mixture of self-esteem, destiny, and dramatic importance. They, they're earned in play and spent to do various things to make the story more interesting and help characters survive and succeed. All right, so what are they? You can spend a fortune point to do any of the following. Luck. After getting a bad result on a dice roll, you make it again, rolling 1d6 plus 6 or 2d6 plus 6, et cetera, if you're rolling more than, than one, so on. Okay. Hell for leather. Before making a roll, you can decide to put your all into action. Downshift a quality that's related to what you're doing in some way, often a personality trait or motivation, and gain an extra 1d6. Narration, you know, uh, spend a fortune point to what? Change uh, the situation? Yes, they're usually related to Scenery objects, sometimes minions, and less often to main characters. They might be useful tacti tactically. Yep. So how do you gain fortune? Huh? Uh, players gain one fortune point at the start of each session. The GM can award an additional point on the spot for any of the following. Flawless victory, succeeding in something that, a notable ch that was a notable challenge. Fickle finger fate, the GM does something bad to your character that you can't avoid. Trouble, invoking a weakness to cause a setback. Uh, indulging, spending your ill-gotten gains between adventures can boost your your fortune supply. Carousing. Um, and GM discretion. All right, learning points. Okay, uh, let's see. There are several things for which a GM awards a lear learning point on the spot. You may find additional situations where it seems merited. Failing a complicated situation. Excuse me. Similarly, losing an important conflict. Understanding. Uh, the character has a significant insight into the way things are. Profound impact. Something that, that might be termed a major life event. Okay. Uh, spending four learning points permits a character to raise one quality by one rank to a maximum of six. Uh, they can be raised one rank at a time, and the substantial and thus substantial jump on the scale should be justified by events in the story. Okay. Yeah, so. So again, much much like experience points, um, you know, it's it's still rather than just hey, here's a bunch of points, and you suddenly have these magical powers, and you're smarter. Uh, certain things within the game need to be justified, uh, not just the earning of them, but also how you spend them and increase these certain abilities, which which I tend to enjoy more. Uh, just you know, just the ding level up uh, effect goes every time you you get to a certain level within games for me is 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 boring. Uh, so, okay, so digging deep down, character is in big trouble and needs more fortune points. Now they may summon up some heroic energy by spending a learning point to get a fortune point. Okay. Dark learning points. Right. Okay. So, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> uh, working with things that are tainted. A another, uh, you know, another aspect of the sword and sorcery gen genre. Okay, carrying on. Uh, let's see here. Danger levels. Okay, this is about altering the consequences of zeroing out of zeroing out effect to reflect different challenges and consequences. There are three levels: drama, risk, and doom. Okay. Yeah. Again, uh, those seem to be self-explanatory. Uh, scar. A scar is a new permanent poor 
negative two weakness quality because it is permanent and must come into play into a re relevant situation. Interesting. Okay, meeting your doom. When a character goes to their end, their remaining fortune points and learning points, but not dark learning points, are shared as evenly as possible between the others in the group. The player decides where any odd ones go. Everyone gets at least one of each. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, so death is not uh, something that uh, is completely avoided within the game, it seems like, but when you decide to do it, it's going to be meaningful and likewise beneficial to the rest of the group. Uh, so yeah, why don't you jump off that cliff? Yeah, I, I, can, I can use some fortune points. Um, but you can rise from the ashes. When a player creates a new character, they have a, they have a number of learning points equal to the number of characters who have previously met their doom in the story of that group of characters. These can be spent straight away or later. Interesting. Okay. So that's, that's kind of cool. That's, that's kind of cool because, you know, obviously losing your, your player, char play, player character in a game sucks, but having something beneficial occur due to your loss, not just for your player characters, which it does, but also something that, that benefits you uh, and stacks over time, that's kind of cool because, you know, you, you're not, you, it may lead your, 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 um, your players to do more daring do and, and other extreme uh, actions within their game because, yes, de death is, is something that is inevitable. Uh, it can be avoided, but uh, it, it, it is something that um, uh, the consequences are not earth-shattering. And therefore, if your character does die, you know that you do have some benefits coming your way uh, if you create a new character. So I, I, I like that idea. I mean, if, if, if I'm reading it correctly, I may, I may, because I haven't read through the whole thing, but I'm, I'm assuming a bit here. But still, even if it's barely, uh, the, you know, the same situation as that, that's cool. I like that. Uh, that's, that, that is going to make for more uh, adventurous role play uh, within your game, uh, you know, having, I, I wouldn't call it, uh, you know, plot armor, but it is definitely something that, um, you know, they're, they're not going to be in constant fear of losing their, their most favorite character because they, you know, they've got 8 million experience points and they've spent all this time, you know, earning all these things. And, you know, if they die, well, shit, it's back to square one again with nothing. All right. So... All right, so continuing on, we have minions are, are, are an option within the game. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much combat here because I assume that the, the rules apply to them generally the same. Uh, magic. Magic's an important thing. Okay. So there's two kinds of magic. Sorcery is a powerful, flexible, ca powerful and flexible, capable of almost any effect, but slow and risky to use. Charms are little bits of magical knowledge that can do a single thing with a limited extent, but are at least safe and reliable. There's also magic like skills of alchemy and divination. So when magical abilities are used, they produce an effect, uh, which you can think of as a kind of temporary free-floating quality. For instance, good plus two healing, average zero illusion, expert plus four, curse of crushing pain, and so on. Uh, the magic effects table overleaf shows how higher ranks enable you to do more with the spell, uh, some of these properties are more about the extent of the effect, broadly, but uh, how much it can affect. Some are about the intensity, right? Be creative in using the simple building blocks of the system to apply an effect as a general guide. Use the ranks MOD uh, to count numbers of things. Uh, average is always taken as one rather than zero for counting or to boost other qualities. Use the ranks target number for resistance. Okay. So sampling effects. Uh, healing, damage, and illusion. We have summoning a demon from the dark and summoning mundane creatures. Sorcery. This is a freeform creation of magical effects. Gathering power. A spell is made by gradually accumulating energy till it reaches the desired level of power. So you're actually building the effect one rank at a time, starting at poor. A sorcerer can cast a poor rank cantrip as a single action, which is handy for special effects like lighting candles with a wave of your hand. Uh, once the required rank is reached, it takes an action to focus and release the spell. 
Keeping control, your sorcery rank uh, dictates the level of power you can handle safely. Fair enough. Drawing from sources. Uh, if some settings, if in some settings, the power for a spell might simply be called to a to a sorcerer uh, through the ether. Okay, got it. In in others, each rank must be drawn from a particular kind of source. So the powerful available at that place and time limits what magic can be done. In the world of six serpents, sorcerers draw on the different urge energies. Uh, other worlds you create might have different ones. Okay. Uh, sorcery in play. Okay, playing character sorcerers. You can certainly do this, and it could be quite interesting. You shouldn't usually have more than one or two in a group. They will wrestle with questions of power versus consciousness or conscience, and it's expected that they will choose to limit themselves to some extent where their NPC counterparts won't. Doesn't sorcery asterisk do a, a lot for one quality? Yes, it does. However, it, it's set up to be used for occasional dramatic effect rather than as a frequent artillery. Okay. All right, so we go on to describe. So there's sorcery, there's charms, so essentially it would be magic weapons. Uh, priests and magic in sword and sorcery. Uh, being a priest of some god's cult mainly involves knowledge, possibly arcane, and social status, possibly inv involving minions. True. Okay. Uh, magical items, uh, sorceress items, and alchemy. So alchemy, we go on to describe, you know, making potions and whatnot. Charm craft, making charms. Uh, divination, trying to gain knowledge through, um, you know, sorceress aspects or other ways. Um, okay. And then we go on to talk about gear, wealth, and trade. So we got props, as mentioned earlier. Uh, types of props here. And then dramatic, to be utilized for dramatic effect. Oh boy, excuse me. Trade, buying stuff. So they go from poor to master, as mentioned earlier. And then we have the world of the six serpents. All right, which I believe might conclude the video. Okay, let me, I just want to go through there. So we've got that about it. All right, let's see. Okay, yeah, I thought so. Okay, so, so just enough to work with to create your world. Uh, I'll read the overview. This is an example of how you can build on the basic rules to create an adventuring world. Feel free to use what you like and discard elements that don't suit you. However, even the latter can be useful illustrations. Most of the land is wilderness of one kind or another, often harsh and holding dangers from weather to wild creatures to the occasional supernatural visitation. Most people gather together in settlements. If you meet someone living out in the wilderness, they're probably weird, extremely tough, not what they seem or fallen on hard times or some combination thereof. By modern standards, there aren't large numbers of people at this point in the setting's history. Okay, good. So there you go. He's kind of given you, you know, the uh, the foundation, uh, but but a um, you know an, an open canvas to to make this world your own or change it as you see fit. And stated just kind of you know, just a few pages here regarding the people and the areas, and then we go into. And we've got some monsters here, uh, which fall into different brackets or categories along with their sizes and other common qualities. So here's the uh, small bestiary. And then we have the GM's notes in the back. So uh, let's see, Tim goes on to uh, give you some adapting to other settings, uh, other PDQ style, uh, other PDQ games, uh, funneling qualities. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, then we go on to describe different races and whatnot, utilizing them if you need to, uh, danger levels and fortune points, and how to do magic. And then we have basic GM advice. So we've got trust being an important part of it. Of course it is. Uh, no need to describe that. Uh, we've got tone. Uh, another thing to make sure you all agree on is the tone for the game. Absolutely. Uh, and then setting up adventures, goals. I mean, goals are important to any uh, gaming group. Uh, matching challenges to keep it interesting. Uh, hazards uh, to, um, you know, to make what you're doing worthwhile. And then rewards for accomplishing them. Uh, the naked princess thing. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, color me curious, because we're almost done here. Uh, the original Sword and Sorcery tales were products of a different age. For instance, Robert E. Howard's short stories of Conan, written in the 1930s, often feature a female foil who is helpless against the physical or sorcerously stranger males. Though she has an even chance of possessing quick wits and a strong will, she probably has minimal clothing and will lose even this as the story progresses. Okay. Uh, Howard sometimes uses it as a measure of character that Conan doesn't force himself on these women. Other sword and sorcery heroes do, though, or at least treat the idea as a routine one. Okay, this fits uncomfortably with the modern sensibilities. Uh, in your game, you'll certainly want to allow strong female player characters. According to Ron Edwards' supplement, Sorcerer and Swords, he sources an inspiration at the end of the book. Uh, there were a couple of early sword and sorcery heroines, so they were rare but not unknown. Uh, in the events of equal opportunities... Oh, it's a bug. In the events of equal opportunities... Uh, blah, blah, blah. you could either decide that all NPCs keep their clothes firmly on or allow all PCs access to preferred choice of companion with a non-stick wardrobe. <laughs> okay, all right. That Okay, that was funny. That was funny. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going to take that as tongue-in-cheek, but uh, that, that was pretty funny. Okay. So examples of in play, uh, you know, uh, GM advice still. Uh, senior in description, story hooks, uh, dealing with problems in the books, and we have some examples for Adventure Seed uh, to start your adventures off, along with some sources and inspiration. Uh, Sorcerer and Sword by Ron Edwards. Um, let's see here. We got The Complete Chronicles of Conan by Howard. Uh, Lieber's Langmore Stories. Uh, Night Winds by Carl Edward Wa uh, Wa Wagner or Wagner. Uh, Black God's Kiss by C.L. Moore. David Gemmell's Books. The Black Company by Glenn Cook, Artesia, which are graphic novels by Mark uh, Smiley, and then films and TV, of course, Conan the Barbarian, the Destroyer, Red Sonja, the Beastmaster, and so on. Uh, music, uh, Conan the Bar Barbarian soundtrack by Basil Poldoris, yes, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End by Hans Zimmer, okay. Uh, the Mummy soundtrack by Jerry Goldsmith, yes, and of course, the Howard Shore soundtrack for Lord of the Rings. Right. So, there we are. Uh, that is a deep dive into Jaws of the Serpents uh, by Tim Gray. Uh, it's interesting. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting system. Uh, it is definitely a... Um, uh, it is definitely a evocative of sword and sorcery. Uh, the, you know, the, the world of the six serpents, the characters, and, and how it's utilized along with the PDQ system... Um, I do like how it's, um, you know, how the, the, the world itself doesn't take over the book. I mean, it's, it's only, you know, I don't think it's barely 150 pages, 120 pages, uh, and just gives you enough, gives you enough to get out there and play and have many, many good adventures, uh, time and time again through Jaws of the Serpents and, uh, have a rewarding, fun time playing it. Uh, I do feel that, uh, it does provide an alternative to your OSR uh, sword and sorcery style games or any other sword and sorcery game. I mean, hell, Pelgrim Press has one uh, that you know uses the gumshoe system. But um, uh, the rules themselves, the, PD, the PDQ system, I feel uh, this was a good choice by Tim uh, to reflect what, pe what most people look for, uh, you know, as they're trying to emulate the adventures of Conan and you know, Cole the Conqueror and so on and so forth. Uh, as you know, as they do these uh, adventures of a, a daring do uh, to go out and, and you know into the wilderness and do what they can to survive, to make coin, to uh, you know have another cup of ale, to you know have that last um, you know side of beef and make just enough coin to spend another another night to wake up an adventure again. Uh, I think it does a good job at it. So, and again, this this came uh, this game itself came recommended outside of Tim. Uh, from others, so um, you know people that I respect and and whose um, uh, whose opinion uh, that I respect. So this would definitely be something that I feel is worth checking out. Uh, obviously, I haven't played it yet, but uh, from from those who who I know enjoyed it. So so yeah, if you if you made it through <laughs> uh, the deep dive, or even if you just you know watched for a few minutes and felt that this might be something interesting. Uh, definitely check it out. I will have a link to Tim's uh, game, Jaws of the Six Serpents, uh, in there. You can go to Drive Through, and I, I assume that you could search for Silver Branch Games, PDQ System, 
Tim Gray, or simply Jaws of the Serpents and pick up your own copy. Uh, the PDF is affordable. Uh, the There is a, a, a print-on-demand uh, PLD version of it, uh, softback, and it's in excellent quality uh, with you know pitch-perfect layout, so it's an easy, quick read. And um, yeah, uh, and likewise, you know, uh, go check out uh, uh, the other games that Tim has uh, uh, on Drive Through. Uh, other games such as I'm going to check my phone here. You know, obviously I am prepared, uh, but you know, games like Albion uh, that Tim has done, which is a Celtic fantasy role playing in a once and future Britain. And uh, Frizon, uh, which is a horror suspense role playing game, uh, amongst others. So, so yeah, definitely go t- go check out Tim's assortment of games, but also specifically go take go take a look at Jaws of the Six Serpent. Uh, get yourself a copy of the PDF, or you know, if you if you're more of a physical reader like I am, it's 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 definitely worth the cost of admission to check out this game, in my opinion, uh, because this being my first time going through it in any detail. Uh, it has um, it has me wanting to run it and play it and see how it plays out because I think it would be a great time and also I do feel that the PDQ system uh, might be something that uh, uh, that you know that rolls well with a con game uh, excuse me and likewise Jaws of the Six Serpents also uh, to make it an interesting sort and sorcery setting with a set of rules that people may not be familiar with. Um, so it's not another rehash of the same game they've been playing time and time again at a con, but the setting they're familiar with and they, I feel that they will have a lot of fun with. So, so there we go. Uh, this has been another episode of a poll from the shelf. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, thank you for making it to the end of this video. Uh, if you like this video, please, you know, subscribe if you feel, uh, like you should do so. Give me a follow on Twitter at uh, Hail Orchestorcus and uh, check out the podcast that I do called Titter Pigs uh, with Keith from Rolling Boxcars, uh, where we do interviews and talk about specific topics within the hobby. Um, there we go. So, uh, everyone, thank you. Have a wonderful day, and we will be talking to you again real soon. And check out Jaws of the Six Serpents. Thank you.